All right, everybody, we're kicking off. Thanks for being here at Crypto and Privacy Village. We've got some amazing speakers here, and I saw a video at Black Hat for how they were introducing their keynote and stuff. Is anybody interested in a Black Hat style intro for our next speaker? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we're on this. All right. Unsa, 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 unsa. People of Earth, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Crypto and Privacy Village. Thank you for being here. Our next amazing topic, unsa, unsa, lasers, 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 <laughs> is cryptanalysis in the time of ransomware. Unsa, 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 lasers, 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 laser fingers, everybody. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the amazing Mark Megan. Thank you very much. That was great. I will never have another intro quite like that. That was that was really really good. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mark Mager. I'm a senior malware researcher at Endgame. Uh, I do reverse engineering and software development. Uh, please do note, I am not a cryptographer, so if I get up here and start babbling about something that's very, very wrong about crypto, please point it out or, you know, take me off to the side and, you know, embarrass me in private. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Magerbomb, just like Jagerbomb. So, just to go over the agenda really quick here, uh, we're going to discuss uh, very briefly a uh, typical ransomware execution flow. Then I'm going to discuss a kind of a high level uh, methodology for working through cryptanalysis of encryption schemes uh, within ransomware. Uh, then I'll do uh, walkthroughs through four uh, unique pieces of ransomware from four different families. Uh, I'll briefly discuss uh, current research that's out in the field, uh, then I'll wrap things up with a conclusion and I'll hopefully have time for questions. So in a typical uh, ransomware variant, what you're gonna see uh, are, are a few different things. So typically a payload is going to be written to disk and executed. Uh, there's going to be some sort of uh, key generation or retrieval routine. Um, optionally there's a exchange, uh, key exchange with the C2 but that's more in uh, asymmetric encryption uh, implementations. So we don't always see that sometimes with uh, symmetric encryption uh, we're going to have hard-coded keys or some sort of uh, key generation that's done on the fly. Um, then, in terms of actually uh, encrypting the files, uh, there has to be enumeration and directory traversal of the contents uh, on the disk. So, as the ransomware goes through uh, the file system, it individually encrypts the files, and sometimes it leaves, uh, you know, very nicely written ransom notes in each directory, just to remind you that you're completely hosed and all your files are gone. So. In order to do uh, cryptanalysis on ransomware, um, you kind of have to attack it kind of like a typical sort of uh, malware reverse engineering or malware analysis scenario. So typically in that sort of scenario, you want to start off with a uh, dynamic analysis approach. Uh, you're basically just detonating the ransomware in a virtualized environment, something that's sandboxed and isn't going to reach out and actually touch any sort of sensitive files that you have. Uh, you know, compromise your uh, your actual host, um, and the goal here is to just uh, you know passively analyze what the ransomware is doing to your environment. So you want to observe any sort of network communications uh, that that are inbound or outbound. Um, you want to look for any sort of forensic artifacts that are going to be left on disk, uh, registry keys being modified, uh, files are being dropped, uh, any sort of effect on event logs. Uh, and then finally, you'll want to actually look at the results of the encryption, right? So you want to analyze the encrypted files. And uh, what we're looking for when I say we want to analyze the files is, right, okay, so if these are encrypted files, you're going to look in there and say, oh, it's crypto, but, you know, it doesn't make any sense. What we're looking for are commonalities kind of across the board between files that are encrypted from multiple different file types. So you want to look for magic byte sequences or watermarks that are either uh, in the header or the footer of the files. Um, and you also want to try to determine if the ransomware is trying to encrypt uh, the entire contents of the file or just uh, implement sort of some sort of uh, partial encryption. Because if their goal is to try to uh, essentially encrypt you know, all files on your system that meet certain uh, file extension uh, restrictions, then 
you know, that's definitely going to be a lot of throughput. And, you know, in order to make it easier for them, sometimes the ransomware authors will only encrypt maybe the first two kilobytes, two megabytes, you know, something along those lines. Um, and when you're doing dynamic analysis, it's definitely okay to repeat your tests multiple times. You know, you have your virtual env virtualized environment. You can do reverts as much as you needed. Uh, so you're going to want to uh, adjust your environment, you know, and control variables uh, as needed uh, in order to gain a little bit better understanding uh, of the ransomware. And when it comes to that, uh, when we're initially deployed within uh, this virtualized environment and we initially detonate the ransomware, we're essentially doing a known plain text attack because just by uh, launching the ransomware, you know, we'll see the cipher texts that are produced. When we revert back to uh, the, the, the clean state before we launch the ransomware, we have our, our, we have our plain text back. So we, knowing that, we can compare uh, the original plain text to the cipher text that we've generated. Now, in more of a chosen plain text scenario, uh, we're going to try to uh, feed specifically crafted files to the ransomware in order for it to, in, uh, in order to try to get it to leak a little bit more of maybe its key stream or key data, uh, something that'll give us a little better idea maybe of what's going on under the hood without having to fully reverse engineer the ransomware. Um, so after initial dynamic analysis and maybe we've learned a, uh, a little bit about the ransomware, uh, we'll want to do more uh, static reverse engineering. And so the goal of this is to, one, identify any sort of uh, crypto algorithms that are going to be used. Uh, if it's something standard like AES, triple does, whatever, um, you know, or, or if it's something more custom, just like a simple XOR. Um, and when we're trying to identify the crypto algorithm, once we find the code section that contains uh, what appears to be the crypto algorithm, uh, we can then look into identifying implement, implementation mistakes that are going to uh, weaken the overall crypto and prov uh, potentially provide us, uh, you know, an avenue that we can attack and, uh, you know, either leak the key or provide us with a decryption capability. Uh, and then the second part of the reverse engineering that we we'll want to look into is how the keys are generated, stored, and transmitted. Uh, so, in that sort of scenario, we're just trying to see if uh, if the key is going to be lying either in memory, uh, hard coded within the binary, you know, or transmitted in the clear where we can obtain it and you know kind of replay it. Um, so going through dynamic analysis and reverse engineering, you know, as we've noted, everything uh, with the ransomware, we're going to apply those lessons learned eventually to uh, development of our decryptor. Uh, so for these walkthroughs, what we're going to focus on is uh, walking through ransomware encryption schemes that have already been defeated uh, and have been publicized. So I didn't want to, you know, spend time working on any like brand new ransomware that's out there and, you know, kind of publicizing exactly what's wrong with it. Uh, because actually, like w when I originally submitted this talk uh, to the Crypto Village, uh, you know, I had the idea that I was going to, you know, get a lot more background on, you know, what some of these ransomware variants were doing and how their encryption uh, was implemented and how it was defeated. But in a lot of those descriptions, it was really uh, described in an abstract manner. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. I think that uh, for certain, like, AV companies or security companies, they're trying to just get you to download their software in order to do the decryption. You know, it's free, whatever. Uh, but on the, on the other side, it's more of an offset concern where they don't want to point out exactly what's wrong with the crypto implementations that the uh, ransomware authors uh, screwed up. So, so they're just trying to say, hey, we have that capability, we can decrypt it for you, but we're not going to point out exactly what's going on. So, uh, you know, kind of going through that, uh, you know, research phase for this talk, uh, I then kind of turned around to say, okay, well, I know that these, these encryption schemes are, are defeatable, so how can I actually, you know, build more of a how-to or walkthrough guide for doing this? So that's more the focus of the talk now. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, these are older variants, no longer in circulation. These are all, you know, mostly from like 2016, 2015. We're going to be doing some high-level reverse engineering, uh, and we're going to focus on uh, detailing the crypto implementations and noting any differences between the ransom note and reality because as we'll see the ransom notes are definitely a little detached from reality sometimes and they're trying to really just scare people you know into uh, into paying the ransoms by just using a lot of technical sounding jargon 
and we'll focus on devising uh, proof of concepts for uh, carrying out our decryption. Okay, so we'll start off with PowerWare. So PowerWare is a uh, PowerShell based ransomware, uh, one of the first, if not uh, the first uh, ransomware family that's based, on, based in PowerShell. And so here's a ransom note that we can see here. And so this says that it's not only using RSA 2048, but it's using AES 128. So it's doubly encrypting your files, so that sounds pretty bad, and they even provide links to Wikipedia because they're so nice. Um, so yeah. And of course they provide instructions for accessing Tor in order to get to, to their site so you can pay off the ransom payment, so they're, you know, very nice guys. So now, uh, the advantage of PowerShell is that, uh, you know, as a scripting language we get access directly to the source code uh, that's deployed with, with power, uh, PowerWare. Uh, but the flip side of that is that of course they can, they can run it through an obfuscator and it it's, might be pretty hard to see from, from this you know, kind of mile high view. This is all of the source code for uh, this, this variant of PowerWare. Um, but the, the very real names are you know, kind of screwed up. They're not very easy to read. It's a mix of uh, Alphanumeric characters, uh, upper and lowercase uh, alphabet characters. So, uh, so one thing we'll do end up doing is uh, deobfuscating it a little bit just to help help us make sense. But uh, as you can follow the arrows and the the red text here, uh, you know it can be chopped up into a, a few different uh, pieces. There's the initial like preamble that includes the crypto setup. There's the actual uh, file and directory enumeration where we're looking for specific file types, uh, like as you might be able to see, like docx, xls. It, it's essentially g walking through the file system and trying to match the file path with one of the extensions that's in that list. And if it matches that, then it runs it through the encryption routine. And I'm pointing out the file write, and you know, in the bottom, there's a file cleanup routine as well that's going to delete the script afterwards. Uh, so, looking more at the crypto setup portion, uh, yeah, as I said before. The uh, variable names are, you know, a mix of upper, lowercase, and uh, numeric characters. So, going through this, we can actually um, provide a little more context in terms of what those variables mean. So, if we just walk through and relabel things, uh, it'll, it'll help provide a clearer picture. And so, things look a lot better uh, after going through doing a little bit of light deobfuscation. Uh, we can kind of see, you know, how certain variables are being used here. So what can we find out here? Well, we're utilizing uh, symmetric encryption, utilizing the Rindle Manage class, uh, which is basically AES, using a 256-bit or 32-byte key. We have an initialization vector that we're specifying. We're padding with zeros and we're using cipher block chaining. Now if we move on to the uh, portion of the code that's contained within the file and directory enumeration, uh, one thing that sticks out right away is the use of this integer value uh, 2048, uh, or two, two kilobytes. And what that basically is saying right here is that only the first two kilobytes of the file are going to be read in and decrypted. And for any files that are less than 2048 uh, bytes, it's just going to completely skip. And looking on uh, the code section directly below, the, below that, we're not making any further modifications uh, to the crypto object that we'd previously um, initialized and configured before. So just something to, to keep in mind. Okay, so now going back to the crypto setup, do we see anything in here that's bad with their implementation? Um, so there, there, there's a few things here. So they're using, you know, they're utilizing symmetric encryption. They're using, you know, basically AES. So in itself, that's not bad, um, as long as they're, you know, doing key management right and you know handling the IVs right. But it, as we can see, yes, it's utilizing a 256-bit key, but it's completely hard coded. They're not doing any sort of unique key generation. It's it's going to utilize the same key for every single file encryption that this script runs, no matter what system it's on, no matter what time of the day, anything. Same key everywhere, and the same thing for the initialization vector. Um, they utilize the same value everywhere all the time. Uh, so with a hard coded key and a hard coded IV, um, they're utilizing uh, CBC mode, and 
those four things combined, that's not good. That's basically a very, very huge vulnerability. And the uh, CWE, uh, if you're familiar with the, the CVE database, uh, actually provides a little bit of background uh, to prove that I'm not just uh, making things up here, but non-random uh, IVs and hard-coded crypto keys are bad news. Okay, so uh, taking what we know, let's try to build our own decryptor. Okay, so I simplified things a little bit here in this uh, in this version of the Power Script. I just cleaned up the the file enumeration just to target a specific text file that's going to be on my desktop. And so I'll click over here. Uh, it just says hello a bunch of times, so nothing too sensitive, I suppose. And I'll run my modified version of the PowerShell script. And it looks like that data's been encrypted. I have no idea what it says now. And so let's see. So we're looking through the code here. What what can we do knowing that you know all all the uh, characteristics we saw earlier? You know how can we how can we decrypt this? <laughs> Wait, could it really be that easy that we change two characters in the PowerShell script and we're going to decrypt everything? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> I wish it were that easy every single time, but you know. <laughs> okay, so moving on to Nimukod. Here's our ransom note. And here they're touting that they're using strong RSA 1024 algorithm with a unique key. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. All right, so we jumped ahead a little bit in this case here. Um, what, what you're seeing here is a pseudocode uh, representation of uh, what is essentially the the enumeration and the encryption function, um, and for this specific binary, this wasn't didn't even take a big level of reverse engineering. Uh, this was literally the first function that's called uh, by the binary. So, you know, popped it in IDA Pro, uh, went to the first function that's called, and then utilized hex rays to decompile it. So I don't have to you know show a bunch of ugly looking uh, disassembly up there. Um, you know, just to give you, you know, high level view of, of what's going on here. But as we can see, uh, it's only going to encrypt the first 2048 bytes again. So two, uh, two kilobyte uh, file size limit or uh, at least buffer limitation for the encryption. Uh, then it's XORing uh, by a static key, uh, which I've highlighted there. Uh, so there's no sign of using anything even close to RSA 1024, AES, whatever. Um, so yeah. That that is their, uh, you know, that is their encryption scheme. So let's go over what we know. We're not using asymmetric crypto. There is no RSA code in here. It is utilizing XOR, and there is no unique key generation. <laughs> it's utilizing a hard coded 255 byte key. It's the same for every file. And we're, it's only going to cover the first uh, 2048 bytes. And on top of that, this is a simple encryptor binary. Okay, so knowing all that, what can we do to decrypt our files? Okay, so here's my very sensitive data again. And so we run through, uh, hold on, we'll pause it real quick. So the way the uh, the encryptor binary works is you just have to pass it uh, on the command line the uh, the path to the specific file that you uh, want to want to encrypt. So knowing that we pass in the path to our uh, test.txt, looks like it goes through and encrypts the first uh, two kilobytes. And then hey, well, well, no, maybe I'll just try running this again. Let's see, let's see what happens. And our files. <laughs> Our file's back. The plain text is back. That was uh, that was pretty miraculous, um, you know. So hopefully I'm not blowing any of your guys' minds. But if you XOR plain text with the same value twice, you're going to end up with the plain text. Okay. 
so moving on to torrent locker and so the, while the first two cases were, were pretty easy, uh, the last two ones are, are a little more complicated and there, there's a little more work that goes into uh, developing the descriptors so bear with me here. Uh, so here's another uh, nicely worded ransom note. This one's a, you know, actually takes uh, advantage of the Windows API for drawing a nice window for us instead of just a plain text file. Um, so it's a using AES uh, 256, it claims to be. And then they're also saying the encryption key is encrypted on top of that with RSA 2048. So now jumping ahead a little bit with this uh, example, uh, if we go in through uh, a debugger, like we're using all the debug in, in this instance, and we're just kind of stepping through and you know looking around uh, the encryption function to see, uh, you know, well not not even the encryption function itself. Literally just going through and we found uh, calls to uh, write file, the Windows API, and then we kind of backtracked a little bit to see if there was any sort of uh, crypto setup before that. And what we see are hard coded references, or hard coded strings that, that seem to reference uh, this library named TomCrypt and uh, specific file paths for uh, C files that you know, seem to be named CTR encrypt and AES.C. So looking at that, okay, AES counter mode. Uh, it, to do a little bit of a sanity check, uh, we can decompile the uh, the function that contains uh, the reference to CTR encrypt, so we can see that all nicely written out there. And since uh, libtomcrypt is an open source library, we can go through and compare that to the exact uh, source code that's available out there. And so you can see, you know, some sort of similarities there, but uh, you know, mostly we're just trying to see if we're within the same ballpark. And that's generally what we're seeing, and we don't really need to get, you know, too deep into that. Uh, we're not, we don't really need to do source code analysis here. Um, so from very limited reverse engineering, we know that uh, you know, it appears to be using AES in counter mode uh, and their implementation is based off of uh, libtomcrypt. We don't know if they've actually modified anything, but you know, ransomware authors tend to be pretty lazy, so they probably just copied it. Uh, so could this potentially be vulnerable? Uh, and you know, as with a lot of other uh, encryption algorithms, uh, symmetric encryption algorithms, yes, they can be uh, subject to implementation flaws. And I provided, you know, a little bit of an excerpt from, uh, you know, this very nicely uh, written paper about uh, uh, counter mode security and uh, basically ways to properly implement AES counter mode along with ways not to. And so this gives us a little bit of a hint to say, okay, well, if they're reusing the key, then that'll give us a little bit of a window into, uh, into what's going on. So We'll keep that in mind, and we'll try to we'll try to prove that. Okay, so how can we test for a flawed AES counter implementation? Well, all right. So here's a little bit of math uh, here. So hopefully this goes over okay. Um, so we're going to want two plain text files. We're going to want one large plain text file that's going to consist solely of null bytes. Uh, and our goal here is that if there's a file size limitation, we want to exhaust a key stream and we want to find that out. As we saw with the previously, uh, the, the two previous examples, there were file size limitations. So we're going to take a stab at that. Um, for B, our second plain text, uh, it's going to be a non-null plain text, uh, just something that's a arbitrary size that's less than A that we can, you know, hopefully use our key stream that we devise uh, to, uh, to decrypt the ciphertext and, and uh, generate the plain text. So what we're going to do is have the ransomware encrypt uh, file A, resulting in A prime or the ciphertext, and then if we take uh, that result, A prime, and we XOR it with A, that should yield the key stream. And since A in this case is null bytes, uh, if we XOR A, or I mean if we XOR anything by null or zero, uh, it's, it's redundant. So what we have in this case, we're supposing is A prime will be our key stream, okay? And then we go through and we encrypt the second file, B, resulting in B prime, and then we take that and we XOR it by the key stream that we generated from, uh, from A, and that should result in our plain text uh, for B. So that's what we're proposing, so let's see if this actually holds true. So as you can see, A.txt is just uh, null bytes, not gonna go through there. Uh, let me pause this real quick. So I 
wrote up this quick little dirty Python script to basically just uh, XOR uh, A prime with B prime. So all we're trying to do is see if that's going to yield the uh, the plain text for B. And for B, uh, B is actually the decryptor. Uh, then in the separate tab, I'll see uh, you'll see that I actually saved a separate copy of the decryptor. It's called decryptor.exe, and because it's it's still just a Python script, but I just changed the file extension, so when I run when I launch the ransomware, it's not going to you know overwrite that file to you. So I can just preserve that copy and go from there. Uh, hold on, let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so going back a little bit, uh, there's our b.py again. Nothing looks too crazy, just xorns and bytes. And there's our fake executable. So we'll go through and launch uh, locker.exe, and we'll see pretty quickly that the files get encrypted. And it dropped the ransom note that we already saw earlier. So we'll pop these two files into a hex editor and what do we see? We see that, um, so this is the cipher text that just generated from A. So we kind of scroll down and at a certain point all we see are null bytes. So either they just start XORing by null or we actually have a limitation to, uh, to, the, to the encryption. Now if we go over to the ciphertext for B, we can see that it looks like, you know, everything in, in there has been encrypted. So nothing, you know, nothing too crazy. So now we go back and we take our decryptor.exe and we rename it to decryptor.py. So we've successfully evaded the ransomware. Takes a while for the rename for some reason. Uh, then we launch our decryptor, and everything looks fine, right? Um, you know, we have pretty much every line, but what we can see at the bottom is that instead of saying print output, it says print out P, and then there's two characters that look garbled. So what do we think happened? Um, so we revisit the ciphertext, and we actually see that the two, uh, the two last characters, U and T for output, are still within the ciphertext. So what do we think happened? Well, what they probably did in this case, and you know, this is without reverse engineering the, uh, the encryption algorithm or anything, uh, what we're supposing is that the, or actually that, that view helps a little better, uh, what we're supposing is that the encryption uh, operates on specific block sizes and if they're using a block size that's uh, you know like four kilobyte or four bytes or, or eight bytes, that's something that's going to be left out, and that's going to be an extraneous uh, chunk that's not part of a that want to be part of the last bro uh, block that's encrypted. So it's just going to be left uh, unencrypted within the ciphertext that's generated. So that's an edge case that you'd have to take into account with a lot of the decryptors that you're writing. You want to be able to test. Uh, you know, a lot of different uh, file sizes, so you can make sure that you know. Yes, if you if you write one one decryptor and it works for this one test case, that's great. But you want to test it across multiple file sizes, multiple file types, in order to cover all your edge cases. So if you write something and you release it to the public, you know, you know, you want to be able to, to make sure it's actually going to reach you know the audience that you want it to. Okay, and let's see. Okay. All right, so moving on, our last example is Apocalypse. And this one sounds pretty cryptic. They're saying all your files are encrypted, everything. You know, the world's coming to an end. And just by doing some dynamic analysis, we launch the ransomware and we pull, you know, multiple uh, ciphertexts in order to compare them a little bit. And what we can see right here is that we have 
what appears to be a watermark, a magic byte sequence uh, that consists of the first four uh, four bytes there. So that's something to go off of for us. Now, if we use the same plain text uh, that consists solely of null bytes that we'd used for our previous example, uh, let's see if this actually generates a little bit more for us. And actually, looking through the file, just through uh, like these, you know, those first uh, few hundred bytes, we can see that there does appear to be some sort of repetition in the ciphertext. Um, you know, it still doesn't exactly, you know, reveal everything to us, but you know, it's 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 something to go off of. It's it's something to note. So, what do we know for, so far? We have what appears to be a magic byte sequence. There's repetition in the ciphertext uh, when we provide a null plain text. The ransom node, if we actually go back to that, it doesn't seem to mention an encryption type. That's kind of odd because all the other ones that we've seen so far mention some sort of industrial grade RSA 4096 and you know AES you know 256 whatever. Um, so it's kind of curious they, they don't mention that they're using some sort of you know high grade encryption. Uh, so let's proceed with reverse engineering from here. Uh, so for this case, we're actually going to utilize uh, IDA Pro. And one thing that you can do right away, uh, and this is definitely a little bit more of a cheat and it's not always going to work, uh, but you can do a simple string search against a binary uh, literally for uh, like instructions in the x86 instruction set. So you can do a uh, text string search for XOR and that will result in uh, finding the XOR operations. Uh, so if we look through the table of the results on the, on the right, we can see that multiple XORs are just clearing out certain registers. So nothing, nothing big there, but the two uh, results at the top, those are the ones that we're going to be interested in. And they both seem to be in, uh, included in the same function, right? So a pretty easy way to look into a binary. Not always going to work, but it's a good place to start and it's, you know, it's worth a shot. So if we actually get into the disassembly uh, of the function that contains those XORs, we can see that those two XORs are included uh, within that block uh, towards the top. And as denoted by the, <coughs> uh, the green line that's going back and forth, those two XORs are going to be looped over. So that sounds, I mean that sounds like it's probably going to be uh, our crypto algorithm. So moving on from there, there's two write file calls. The, the first write file includes the previously uh, ASCII representation of the previously identified byte sequence uh, for the magic byte sequence. The second write file and appears to write out the transform buffer that's affected by the XORs that we saw from earlier. Okay. And here's a decompiled view of uh, that same code section. We extrapolate it out to cover uh, more, uh, more code within that function. And, you know, this gives us a little bit more of a sanity check to determine, okay, all right, this really does look like we're reading in file contents and we're just transforming them. And there's, you know, one specific line within the, <clears throat> within the decompilation that we're going to focus on. So as we can see on the right, I've narrowed it down to, uh, you know, just the nuts and bolts of the encryption. And in this case, it's using a hard-coded key, which we've identified there. And all it really looks like it's doing is it's utilizing those two XORs, but there's a little bit more math involved here. Um, but it's, you know, just looping over that until it's, until it's exhausted, uh, you know, all the contents within the buffer. Now, if we look on the left, there's a Python script that I wrote to essentially mimic everything that we see here. Uh, there's nothing too special about it. I first read in the, uh, the first four bytes. I save that off to the, the header and it, you know, we could do a little bit more of a, of a sanity check to make sure it matches up with the, uh, <coughs> with the previously identified magic byte sequence in order to, uh, in order to confirm that we're working with a encrypted file. Um, you know, so, but as I said earlier, proof of concept, you know, this doesn't have to work for every single file. Um, then from there, we're just individually reading in bytes and transforming them according to the set of operations that we spef specified there, and we're writing it out to a uh, write out to a separate file. Okay, so let's test out this script.
Okay, so we start out with our script on the left. Uh, on the right, I just have the uh, the output file already created, but it's just set to uh, null data. So just to uh, you know, just show you that there's nothing in there already. Uh, so the readme.txt, the original plain text that we're using, is just a readme file for Ollie debug. That was our cryptex or ciphertext to the left. And we run it through our script, and it looks like everything is good. So we've generated our plain text again. So research in the field. Uh, despite the overall proliferation of ransomware in the last few years, uh, researchers have managed to keep pace. Uh, and it's pretty impressive considering, you know, how much money is going around and is involved within ransomware. I think there's been estimates that in 2016, over a billion dollars was, uh, you know, was successfully uh, solicited from, uh, from victims of ransomware. So new variants and new families are popping up day by day, but there are researchers that are out there that, you know, we're really working hard towards, uh, you know, reverse engineering and, and analyzing uh, all these samples, and you know, more importantly, uh, developing and releasing decryptors to the public uh, for free in order to uh, for victims to get access back to their data. Um, the bleeping computer forums are a really good uh, source to start with uh, if you're trying to research uh, decryptors. Uh, Blood Dolly is one of the very active members there. Uh, Malware Hunter Team, Malware Tech, Demon Slay. Uh, those guys are all very intricately involved in developing uh, decryptors and reverse engineering ransomware. Uh, MalwareTech is pretty famous for his WannaCry kill switch that saved people quite a bit of time and pain. And there's definitely several others. And you know, there's a lot of companies also involved in, in uh, developing and releasing these decryptors to the public. And it's, it's something that definitely should be noted because, you know, you know, as I said last year, you know, over a billion dollars was collected from people, but, uh, you know, people are releasing these decryptors for free to the public. And it really is a, a nice service that they're providing, uh, you know, not only to, to the security community, but to users in general of the internet. So to wrap things up, um, crypto implementations are very prevalent in ransomware. Crypto is hard. Uh, Ransom notes are definitely not the most trustworthy source for uh, crypto implementation technical specs. So don't believe the hype if you see a really bad ransom note. It's not always going to be truthful. And as with just normal malware analysis, uh, the reverse engineering and crypto analysis of ransomware and decryptor development, they're not, they're not linear processes. Um, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. Uh, you'll want to utilize uh, chosen plain text attacks when you can uh, in order to try to leak out more information about the uh, encryption algorithm without having to fully reverse engineer it. And you'll want to focus on sections uh, within the code, uh, you know, whether it's the disassembly or running through debugger, whatever, uh, where modifications are going to occur. Uh, then from there, you can use that as a base to dig deeper for more clues uh, in order to, you know, help uh, get a better idea of what's going on with the encryption. And, you know, initially focus on building out a proof of concept. You know, do a lot of stress testing so you can cover all of the edge cases like we saw with uh, Torrent Locker. And, you know, so you stress test, you harden, and you cover all the edge cases, and hopefully you have yourself a fully working decryptor that's going to work across the board. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. All right, time for questions. Hey, thanks for, uh, wait, the mic isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah. So after sort of analyzing all this crypto ransomware and sort of clustering together, I guess, the mistakes that all of these authors make, can you sort of, um, you know, associate them with like a group like skiddies or like professional criminals or like software engineers. Like, who is writing this shit? Uh, so that kind of varies, uh, like from case to case, because there's definitely um, a lot of cases where you can tell by reverse engineering the code that that it really doesn't reach that uh, you know level of complexity that's like typically seen in more like an APT sort of scenario. 
Um, so uh, what we're what we're seeing uh, a lot lately is the rise of ransomware as a service and ransomware kits that are uh, that are developed by more uh, more seasoned developers. And they offer it up to uh, like budding cyber criminals who want to launch their own ransomware attacks and get some of that you know sweet Bitcoin. Um, so so I, I see that being as more of a cottage industry that's going to develop a little bit more. Um, you know, but mostly the, the the cyber criminals that are developing their own ransomware. I would say right now the, the complexity complexity isn't isn't uh, you know where you would kind of expect it to be with the profits that have been generated so far. Uh, I I do I do have plenty of examples, uh, but then I want to be able to decrypt them, so that one I think is good. Uh, but with a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the ransomware that that does the encryption right, they're utilizing uh, asymmetric encryption, so they're doing some sort of key exchange uh, with a C2, so they have a little more, bit more network infrastructure involved. Um, but right, as long as they're doing the key exchange correctly, that Seems to cover most of their bases, and that, it, in that case, then you're kind of left with just hoping for some sort of like side channel attack or, or uh, some artifacts being left on disk for finding and recovering a key. So, any other questions? All right, thanks for your time.